as I am sitting here with you, I would like to recall the many reminiscences of a friend. His name is Dante. Dante. This was that Dante who was granted to our age by the special grace of God. This was that Dante who first was destined to open the way for the return to Italy of the banished muses. By him, the glory of the Florentine idiom was made manifest. By him, all the beauties of the common speech were set to fitting numbers. By him, dead poetry may properly be said to have been revived. These things, if fittingly considered, will show that he could have rightly had no other name than Dante. Of all the events in his life, this first one comes to my mind, when Dante first meets Beatrice. He was the prey of the fierce and unendurable passion of love. He began to compose verses of love, as may be seen in a little work of his, in vernacular called the Vita Nuova. It was the custom in our city for men and women to hold festivals, each in his own district and with his own friends. Therefore, among others, it chanced that Folco Portinari, a man much honored among his fellow citizens at that time, gathered his neighbors together in his own house for a feast on the first day of May. Among these was Dante, who had not yet finished his ninth year. Here, mingling with others of his own age, for there were many such in the house of his host, both boys and girls, there was among the crowd of children a little daughter of Portinari, whose name was Bice, although he always called her by her full name, that is, Beatrice, who was perhaps eight years old, very comely for her age, and very gentle and pleasing in her actions, and besides this with features very delicate and well-formed, and further so full of beauty and of sweet winsomeness that she was declared by many to be like a little angel. Nine times already since my birth, the starry heaven of light had returned almost to the self-same point on its revolution. When first appeared to my eyes the glorious lady of my mind, she was by many called Beatrice, not knowing wherefore she was so called. She had been so long in this life that in her time the starry heavens had moved towards the Orient one of the twelve parts of a degree, so that almost at the beginning of her ninth year she appeared to me, and I beheld her almost at the end of my ninth year. And she appeared to me clad in a most noble color, a subdued and pure crimson, girded and adorned in a manner befitting her extreme youth. At that moment, I say truly that the spirit of life, which dwells in the most secret chamber of the heart, began to tremble so violently that it was painfully perceptible in the smallest pulses. And trembling, it spake these words, Behold a God stronger than I, who coming shall rule over me. At that moment, the animal spirit that inhabits the high chamber where the sensitive spirits have their perceptions began to marvel greatly and speaking more especially to the spirit of the eyes, he said these words, your beatitude has now been manifested to you. After a period of so many days that exactly completed the nine years since the above described apparition of that most gentle one, on the last of these days, it happened that that most beauteous lady appeared to me in a dress of the purest white between two gentle ladies, elder than herself. And passing along a street, she turned her eyes towards that part where I was stood trembling. 
and through her ineffable courtesy, which today meets with its reward in the highest sphere, saluted me so virtuously that it seemed to me I there beheld the very limits of all blessedness. The hour when her most sweet salutation was given to me was exactly the ninth hour of the day. And since this was the first time her words fell on my ears, so sweet was the effect on me, as one inebriated, I withdrew from other folk. I took refuge in a solitary place, and uh, in the loneliness of my room, betook myself to think of this most courteous one. And uh, thinking of her, a soothing sleep overcame me, in which a marvelous vision was shown to me. I seemed to behold in my chamber a cloud of the color of fire, within which I discerned the form of a man of terrible aspect to beholders. Yet, with all he seemed so full of joyousness, it was a wonder to gaze upon. In his speech, he said many words of uh, which I could understand but few. Among them these, ego dominus tuus, I am your Lord. In his arms, he seemed to bear a nude figure sleeping wrapped lightly in a blood-red cloth, at which, gazing intently, I recognized the lady of the salutation who the previous day had deigned me to salute me. In one hand, this same one held a thing which was all aflame. Mitzim, I heard him say, vide cor tuum. Behold your heart. And after he had tarried a little while, I perceived that he wakened her that slept, and so wrote upon her through his skill, he made her eat of that which burned in his hand. She ate as one afeard. In a brief space, his mirth was changed to bitter weeping. Thus weeping, he gathered the lady in his arms, and then it seemed to me he departed with her heavenward, at which I suffered such great anguish, my light sleep was thereby broken, and I awaked. Immediately, I began to ponder, and I found that the hour in which this vision appeared to me was the fourth hour of the night. Wherefore, it was manifest that it had occurred in the first of the last nine hours of the night. Amore, love I found in this noble lady. Tanto gentile e tanto onesta pare la donna mia quando ella altrui saluta, con ne lingua diven tremando muta, e gli occhi non l'ardiscon di guardare. Ella si va, sentendosi laudare, benignamente d'umiltà vestuta, e par che sia una cosa venuta da cielo in terra a miracol mostrare. Mostrasi sì piacente a chi la mira che dà per gli occhi una dolcezza al core che intender non la può chi non la prova. E par che della sua labbia si mova uno spirito soave, pien d'amore, che va dicendo all'anima, sospira. Beatrice becomes a central event in Dante's life. She is a figura Christi. She represents the incarnation of the Lord. The salvation of Dante's soul is placed in the hands of a lovely woman. Just like Christ sacrificed himself for the salvation of all humanity, 
Beatrice dies to save Dante. As everyone can plainly understand, there is nothing stable in this world, and if there be anything that is easily changed, it is our life. The beautiful Beatrice was nearly at the end of her 24th year when she left this world and departed to the glory. At her departure, Dante was left in such sorrow, grief, and tears that many of those nearest him, both relatives and friends, believed there would be no other end to them except his death. The days were like the nights, and the nights like days. It happened that a grievous illness affected a certain part of my body, from which I continually suffered for nine days from the most bitter pain. This made me so weak that I was forced to stay like one who could not move. I say that on the ninth day, feeling almost intolerable grief, a thought came to me that was about my lady. And when I had thought of her a while, I returned to thinking about my weakened existence. And seeing how fragile our strength is, even in health, I began to weep about our miserable state. Then sighing deeply, I said to myself likewise, of necessity, it must be that sometime the most grateful Beatrice must also die. And it threw me into such intense bewilderment that I closed my eyes and began to be tormented by imagining this like a delirious person. So that at the start of the wanderings of my imagination, the faces of certain women with disheveled hair appeared to me, who said to me, you will surely die. And then after these women, diverse other faces appeared to me, terrible to look on, that said to me, you are dead. So, my imagination beginning to wander, I came to a place not knowing where I was. And it seemed to me I saw women weeping with disheveled hair going through the street in extreme sadness. And then the sun seemed to me to be darkened so that the stars showed themselves of a color such that I judged they were weeping. And it seemed to me that birds flying in the air fell dead. And there were massive tremors. And marveling in this fantasy, and very fearful, I imagined that a friend came to me saying, do you not know your miraculous lady has departed this world? Then I began to weep most speechlessly. And I did not only weep in imagination, but wept with my eyes, bathing them in real tears. I imagine I was gazing at the sky, and I seemed to see a multitude of angels who were returning to their place. And in front of them, they had the widest of little clouds. It seemed to me these angels were singing gloriously and the words of their singing, I seem to hear, were those of Hosanna in excelsis, Hosanna in the highest. And I could hear no more. Then it seemed that, to me that my heart, where there was so much love, said to me, it is true, our lady lies dead. And at, at this, I seemed to go to gaze on the body in which that most beautiful and noble spirit had lived. And the wanderings of my imagination were so intense that that lady, that lady was shown to me. And it seemed to me that women covered her, her head, that is, with a white veil. And it seemed to me 
that her face has such a look of humility that she seemed to say, I am gazing on the source of peace. In this imagining, I felt so much humility at seeing her that I called death and said, sweetest death, come to me. Do not be cruel to me, for you must have become gentle after being in such a place. Now come to me, who desire you greatly, and you will see that I already wear your colors. And when I had seen the sad offices completed that are usually performed for the bodies of the dead, it seemed I returned to my room, and there I seemed to gaze at the sky, and my imagination was so intense that weeping, I began to say in my true voice, Oh, most beautiful soul, how blessed is he who beholds you. And while I was speaking these words with a painful anguish of tears and calling to death to come to me, a young and gentle lady who was beside my bed, thinking that my tears and my words were solely from grief at my infirmity, began to weep herself with great fearfulness, so that other women who were in the room realized that I wept because of the distress that they saw created in her. So making her, who was closely related to me, leave me, they came to me to wake me, thinking that I was dreaming, and said, sleep no more, and do not be troubled. And by their speaking, this powerful imagining was broken off at the moment that I was about to say, oh, Beatrice, you are blessed. And I had already said these words, oh, Beatrice, when I opened my eyes suddenly and realized that I had been imagining. And though I spoke her name, my voice was so broken by sobbing that I felt these ladies had not understood. Quomodo sedet sola civitas plena populo. Facta est quasi vidua domina gentium. How does the city sit solitary that was full of people? How is she become a widow? A few days after this, the Lord of Justice called this most gentle one to glory under the sign of that queen, the Blessed Virgin Mary, whose name was held in greatest reverence in these words of this Blessed Beatrice. When my eyes had wept for some while and were so affected that they could no longer relieve my sadness, there appeared to me a miraculous vision in which I saw things that made me not provide more concerning this most blessed lady until such time as I am able to treat more worthily of her. And to attain to this, I strive as much as I can, and this she knows well. And if it be pleasing to him through whom all things have their life, that my life last some few years, I hope to say of her things that were never yet written of any woman. Hereafter, may it be the pleasure of him who is the Lord of grace, that my spirit go to see the glory of its lady, that is that blessed Beatrice, who gloriously gazes into the face of he, qui est per omnia secula benedictus. In Dante's time, the cities of Florence were perversely divided into two parties. In 1300, on the plan of uniting the divided body of his city, Dante was elected to serve as one of the priors of the Florentine Republic. But the plans of men are most often defeated by the power of heaven. Two years later, Dante himself would be exiled from Florence after the black faction, conniving with Pope Boniface VIII, took control of the city. Dante spent several years in humiliating poverty, dependent on the char charity of patrons in various courts of Central 
and northern Italy. Then, around 1307, he felt he had gone utterly astray, spiritually speaking, as if in a dark wood. Then something happened, and a way opened up to him. The way took the form of a poem he called the Commedia, which I called Divina. The subject of this work must be understood as taken according to the letter, and then as interpreted according to the allegorical meaning. The subject, then, of the whole work, taken according to the letter alone, is simply a consideration of the state of souls after death. For from and around this, the whole notion of the work turns. But if the work is considered according to its allegorical meaning, the subject is man, liable to reward or punishment of justice, according as to the freedom of the will he is deserving or undeserving. The aim of the work is to remove those living in this life from a state of misery and to guide them to a state of happiness. The title of the book is Here Begins the Comedy of Dante Alighieri, a Florentine by birth, but not by character. And for comprehension of this, it must be understood that comedy is a certain kind of poetical narrative which differs from all others. Comedy begins with adverse circumstances, but its theme has a happy termination. From this, it is evident why the present work is called a comedy. For, if we consider the theme, in its beginning it is horrible and foul because it is hell. In its ending, fortunate, desirable, and jo joyful because it is paradise. Nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita mi ritrovai per una selva oscura che la diritta via era smarrita. Ai, quanto a dir qual era e cosa dura esta selva selvaggia e aspra e forte che nel pensier rinnova la paura, ante amara che poco è più morte. Ma per trattar del ben che vi trovai dirò delle altre cose che vi scorte. Io non so ben ridir come vintrai, tant'era pien di sonno a quel punto che la verace via abbandonai. In Canto II of the Inferno, Dante turns into verse the intercession of Beatrice, who, descending from heaven into limbo, sent the Roman poet Virgil to Dante's rescue in his moment of danger, as Dante found himself lost in the dark wood of Inferno I. With Virgil as his guide, the Commedia's pilgrim undertakes a grim journey through the circles of hell, followed by an arduous trek up the terraces of the mountain of Purgatory. Here, Virgil narrates the episode of his encounter with Beatrice. Io era tra color che son sospesi, e donna mi chiamò, beata e bella, tal che di comandare io la richiesi. Lucevan gli occhi suoi più che la stella, e cominciò mi a dir soave e piana, con angelica voce in sua favella. Oh, anima cortese mantoana, di cui la fama ancor nel mondo dura e durerà quanto il mondo lontana. L'amico mio, e non dell'avventura, nella diserta piaggia è impedito sin nel cammin che volta è per paura. E temo che non sia già si smarrito ch'io mi sia tardi al soccorso levata per quel ch'io ho di lui nel cielo udito. Or movi, e con la tua parola ornata e con ciò che ha mestieri al suo campare, l'aiuta sì che io ne sia consolata. 
Io sono Beatrice che ti faccio andare. Vegno del loco ve tornar disio. Amor mi mosse che mi fa parlare. Quando sarò dinanzi al Signor mio, di te mi loderò sovente a Lui. Virgil takes Dante as far as the Garden of Eden, where he turns him over to Beatrice, who will be Dante's guide as they ascend the nine spheres of heaven and become the embodiment of theology. The Beatrice we meet in the Commedia both is and is not the Beatrice of the Vita Nuova. The latter was not a fictional character, but real, a historically incarnate woman who served as the inspirational basis for the more allegorical character of the Commedia. At the break of the day, I have seen the sky, its eastern part all rosy, and the rest serene and clear, even as the sun's face rose obscured, so that through tempering mist the eye could bear it longer. Thus, within that cloud of blossoms rising from angelic hands and fluttering back down into the chariot and around it, olive crowned above a veil of white appeared to me a lady beneath a green mantle, dressed in the color of a living flame. And in my spirit, which for so long a time had not been overcome with awe that used to make me tremble in her presence, even though I could not see her with my eyes, through the hidden force that came from her, I felt the overwhelming power of that ancient love. As soon as that majestic force, which had already pierced me once before I had outgrown my childhood, struck my eyes, I turned to my left with the confidence a child has run into his mama when he is afraid or in distress to say to Virgil, not a single drop of blood remains in me that does not tremble and I know the signs of the ancient flame. But Virgil had departed, leaving us bereft. Virgil, sweetest of fathers, Virgil, to whom I gave myself for my salvation. And not all our ancient mother lost could save my cheeks, washed in the dew, from being stained again with tears. Dante, because Virgil has departed, do not weep, do not weep yet. There is another sword to make you weep. Dante ascends into paradise where he will see the ineffable glory of the blessed. A story as beauteous and fascinating as was ever conceived let alone heard by any. Beatrice alone is to guide him forward into higher regions he is now approaching. In Paradiso III, Dante sees the soul of Picarda Donati, a woman who suffers a truly tragic fate. Wishing to be a nun, she is dragged by her family from her cloister and forced to live her life in marriage. This so-called weakness of Picarda prevented her from keeping her religious vow. She explains to the pilgrim that all the souls are content wherever they find themselves in the hierarchy of paradise. She shows to Dante a different kind of love, a love that is, a, that is an expression of reciprocity between human will and the will of God. The glory of him who moves everything, penetrates the universe and shines with more splendor in one part, with less in another. Heaven it is that receives most of his light. There have I been, and have seen things which he who descends neither knows how nor is able to relate, because as our intellect draws near to its desire, it reaches such depths that memory cannot go back along the track. Whatever of the holy realm I could treasure, 
up in my mind shall now be the theme of my song. And addressing myself to the shade that seemed most keen to speak, I began like a man muddled by excessive zeal. O oh, spirit made for bliss, who in the beams of life eternal savor the sweetness that, untasted, cannot be understood. I shall take it as a kindness if you share with me your name and lot and the lot of others here. Then she, eager and with smiling eye, Our love shut not its doors against just well any more than does the love of God who wills that all his court be like himself. In the world I was a virgin sister. If you search your memory, my having grown more fair will not conceal my name, and you will recognize me as Picarda, placed here among these other blessed souls, and blessed am I in the slowest of these fears. Our affections, which are inflamed only when they please the Holy Spirit, take joy in our adherence to his plan. And this is our lot, which seems so very low, is given us because of vows neglected and in part no longer valid. Then I said to her, from your transfigured faces shines forth a divinity I do not know, and it transforms the images I can recall. That is why my memory works so slowly. But now what you have said has helped me and I more readily recall your features. But tell me, do you who are here content desire to achieve a higher place where you might see still more and make yourselves more dear? Along with the other shades, she smiled, then answered me with so much gladness she seemed delight with love's first fire. Brother, the power of love subdues our will so that we long for only what we have and serves for nothing else. If we desire to be more exalted, our desires will be discordant with his will, which assigns us to this place. That, as you will see, would not benefit the circles if to be ruled by love is here required and if you consider well the nature of that love. No, it is the very essence of this blessed state that we remain within the will of God so that our wills combine in unity. Therefore, our rank, from height to height throughout this kingdom, pleases all the kingdom as it delights the king who wills us to his will. And in his will is our peace. It is to that sea we all things move, both what his will creates and that which nature makes. Then it was clear to me that Everywhere in heaven is paradise, even if the grace of the highest good does not rain down in equal measure. This place transcends all human power of conception. No other site could ever be preferred to this one because all good is there collected and whatever is defective outside is perfect here. At the end of his journey, in the concluding verses of Paradise 33, Dante's impossible desire is fulfilled. Now Beatrice has left, my friend, and he sees her high above in one of the circles of the rose. A sudden flash of light illuminates Dante's mind and enables him to see so much of that inscrutable mystery. Here, the vision ends. Così la mente mia, tutta sospesa, mirava fissa, immobile e attenta, e sempre di mirar faceasi accesa. A quella luce cotal si diventa, che volgersi da lei per altro aspetto è impossibile che mai si consenta. Però che il ben 
che è del volere obietto, tutto s'accoglie in lei e fuor di quella è defettivo ciò che è lì perfetto. Ormai sarà più corta mia favella, pur a quel che io ricordo, che d'un fante che bagna ancora la lingua la mammella. Non perché più che un semplice sembiante fosse nel vivo lume che io mirava, che tale sempre qual sera davanti, ma per la vista che s'avvalorava in me guardando una sola parvenza, mutando mio, a me si travagliava. Nella profonda e chiara sussistenza dell'alto lume parvermi tre giri di tre colori e d'una contenenza. E l'un dall'altro, come iri da iri, pare a riflesso, e il terzo pare a fuoco, che quinci e quindi ugualmente si spiri. Oh, quanto è corto il dire, e come fioco il mio concetto, e questo, quel che vidi, è tanto, che non basta dicer poco. O oh, luce eterna, che sola in te sidi, sola ti intendi, e da te intelletta e intendente te ami e arridi. Quella circolazione che si concetta pareva in te come il lume riflesso dagli occhi miei alquanto circunspetta dentro da sé del suo colore stesso mi parve pinta della nostra effigie perché il mio viso in lei tutto era messo qual è il geometra che tutto s'affige per misurarlo cerchio e non ritrova pensando quel principio ondelle indige Tal era io a quella vista nova. Veder voleva come si convenne di mago al cerchio e come vi si indova. Ma non eran da ciò le proprie penne. E non che la mente mia fu percossa da un fulgore in che sua voglia venne. All'alta fantasia qui mancò possa. Ma già volgeva il mio desio e il velle, siccome rota, ugualmente possa l'amore che muove il sole e l'altra estate.